Uh, I also want to comment at the start just to give some framing for what I'm going to present. I often get interpreted as not being supportive of immigration, which is not true at all. What I'm going to be talking about is immigration as a driver of growth, but immigration also plays an important role for backfill and churn needs in the labor market. So the numbers we talk about when we're backfilling for retirements or out migrants, there's an important role for matching skills in the labor market, dealing with friction. So I'm not trying to say any of that is wrong to do. I'm going to talk about immigration as a driver of growth. And what I want to do is bring some clarity into thinking about how does an economy like Newfoundland actually operate? How does it actually grow? What can we expect to see if you start adding people to it? And the reason I think this is important to do is because in the policy world, we kind of lost some of the attachment to some of the underlying uh, rigor and modeling that had gone on. And what's happening now is we're often talking about two different models of how we think the economy works and we're yelling at each other about a policy prescription. But what we're really not being clear on is we started out with different assumptions about what we think will happen. And then to get into health, I want to show you while we're waiting for growth to return, what's going on with our promises on healthcare spending. And basically, I want to show you what a fiscal time bomb looks like. And then I want to try and convince you that population aging isn't really the problem, that we need to take action on other fronts so that we even have a hope to worry about addressing uh, the population aging issue. And one other observation I want to start with is my bias comes from working in Western Canada, where everything was based on how do you get investment and the labor will follow. Since moving to Eastern Canada, it always talks about labor with no discussion of investment. So some of it is reversing the thinking, thinking about how do we stimulate labor demand, that will bring in the labor, as opposed to pushing labor and hoping that will cause the labor demand. But again, I think the problem is in a booming economy like the West that I've lived in, which is what I think everyone in the East is aspiring to experience, and it is pretty cool, your house price goes up a lot, but on the other side of it, you need to think about what is the condition that causes that to happen. And Saskatchewan will be an example I bring up. Now, for my first Captain Obvious point, uh, if you've seen those ads, one of the things we need to think about is that the impacts of population aging will depend on how much of it we're going to see. How much of it we're going to see is going to be a function of how much growth we have in the economy. So if we don't have much growth, we're going to have the one person paddling hard, uh, dragging along the rest of the dependents. And in other cases, we see the fiscal time bombs, the pensions, health care, and all those demands on spending, which are going to be coming from a smaller tax base. Now, if we look at population projections, and I apologize for the tiny font, on the one panel, we have the share of population 65 plus from 1971 to 2038. And for Canada, the orange line, I've extended it to 2060. You can see that right now we're in the midst of the uh, hot period of all this population aging. And what you can see is that Newfoundland went from, it's the bottom gray line going up to the yellow one. It went from a relatively advantageous position in terms of a young population, and now it's one of the oldest. Right below it is Nova Scotia and New Brunswick, which are indistinguishable in the projections I have here. So again, the slower your growth, the more aging you have. And the two down below are Manitoba and Saskatchewan. Saskatchewan was once one of the oldest provinces, now it's becoming one of the youngest. Why did it do that? Because after 2010, they had the commodities boom. They got the growth. Their population went from 1 million to 1.2 million. The important message here is it didn't take a generation. It took less than a decade. So when these resource-based economies fire, the turnaround can be quite quick. So you shouldn't be thinking about we're working on a 60-year solution. This could actually be something that turns around quickly as you experienced again with your previous oil boom. These things happen fast. What matters is what do you do while the boom is on? How do you capitalize those gains so that they last? And that's the real challenge in the resource economy. Now, the panel to the right, the population size, all that's trying to show is that when you have a stagnant or declining population, you get more population aging. If you can spur the growth like Saskatchewan did after 2010, you get younger. So how do we get population growth? We need to think about, are we trying to solve a population problem? Do we need population growth to get economic growth? Or do we have an economic growth problem? We have to stimulate growth and that will get us more population. Now again, this may seem obvious, but often people aren't clear which problem we're trying to solve. And what I'm going to try and go through is that I think that we need more growth to spur population as opposed to more population to spur growth. 
Now, in a closed economy, this is the model that most economists today think of because in Canada, we don't teach about the Canadian economy anymore. Most economists are learning a lot about the United States, the European Union, and they think in terms of a closed economy model. Now, why does this matter? It's because it gives you a particular view on something like population aging, which is you have two segments to it in these models. One is when you're young, you sell your labor, you get wage income, and then you save for retirement. That savings in a closed economy equals the capital stock from investment. So the more you save, the more capital you have, and then the more young workers you have, the more labor you have. So what really matters in this economy, because wages depend on how much capital there is per worker, is the ratio of young workers to old workers, and that's going to affect the wage rate and the return on capital. So most of the effects are distributional. If you're in the baby boom, you face low wages when you're young, and then you're gonna face low interest rates when you're old. But if I'm a young worker in this economy and the baby boomers retire, that's amazing. I've got really high wages. Because in these models, I'm always fully employed too. No one is ever unemployed in these models. So when we think about what's going on, this is often the model where people say we need more immigration to get growth. Because I can add inputs to this economy and make it bigger. And that will affect the rate of return to capital, the rate of return to labor through the wage rate. But again, there's really no big problem here with population aging. Uh, because what's happening here as well is that as the baby boomers get old and that capital stock rises, labor productivity has risen to bail us out of whatever problems we're going to come with population aging. So in the closed economy, productivity can rise. That's the key feature of it. So if this is the model that's behind everyone's thinking, we have to be clear that this is not Newfoundland. Newfoundland is not a closed economy. Um, I'm getting ahead of myself here, but the important thing in the closed economy is the distributional impacts. Higher taxes on young workers are not a problem because they have higher labor incomes. This is actually intergenerationally progressive, that we should be taking more money from the young because they're getting a really high wage because of all that capital. And this will compensate in part for the lower return to capital. And you're still better off than the previous generation, even at the higher tax rate. So this is the don't worry, be happy model of population aging. So this one, I wouldn't even say we have any problems to worry about. If there is going to be a loss of standard of living, as Bill Scarth has calculated, it's going to be about 2% in the long run of per capita GDP is uh, lower. And this is largely due because we have too many old people relative to young. So the, the low incomes of retired baby boomers is what drives the lower standard of living, not the lower wage income of young workers. This is not the way we're thinking about the problem currently. We're worried about the young workers and are they gonna have any standard of living? So Newfoundland's a small open economy. I put up Donald Savoie's fine book, Visiting Grandchildren, which kind of gets at this point in a very visual way, that what we have to worry about now is labor and capital move. And in a small open economy, the amount of capital and labor that's here is all determined by labor, by uh, demand for what you export. The wage rate you pay is not set in the local economy, it's set by the external economy. So whether you recognize it or not, what matters for your wage rates here is what's happening in Toronto or Alberta, not what's happening here. If you can't pay the return to capital, that capital will move somewhere else. So the, the horrible feature of this economy is that your capital labor ratio that determines wage rates and interest rates can't change in the long run. You can't push productivity growth. You can't add labor to get growth. The only thing that changes this economy is demand for the exports, because that's the only thing that can shift labor demand. So population aging is a growth problem in this context, not a distributional problem. And the important impacts are borne by the immobile population. If you're stuck here, you're gonna bear most of the burden of, a, of the adjustment that's coming from population aging. And this is all because the capital labor ratio, which determines wages, which determines interest rates, is fixed because of this arbitrage condition. That if you do a bad job attracting capital, it goes somewhere else, they get rich, not you. But what ends up happening is labor follows them. So the economy tends to adjust not by getting richer or poorer, but by getting bigger or smaller. Now as population falls, let's say we get a negative shock like oil prices fell, some of the labor now goes out. The problem now is capital is going to follow it. 
because as you have fewer workers around, the interest rate wants to fall, so capital goes. So now we're starting to get a contraction. And this is where you start to get the economic death spiral. The more labor and capital that go out because they're not moving in opposite directions, the smaller your economy gets. The immobile population that has needs remains behind, their costs are going up, and they have a smaller tax base on which to lever things out of. The important point here is that the uh, comments made by uh, the minister were correct in terms of those uh, adjustment problems. The challenge is you can't just add people to fix it. Because if you try to add a person to this economy, there isn't enough capital. They don't earn the wage rate, they're just going to leave anyway. So this all comes back to labor demand. How do we get demand for the exports up? So what we wind up with um, is uh, in immigration solving the problem. What we have to think now is the value of a worker in this economy determined by their human capital, so their university degrees, their experience, their entrepreneurial spirit, or is it determined by the demand for the human capital that they have? And this is the thought experiment that we don't do enough about. So what we often think is that if I just find a bunch of people with university degrees, I'll stick them in St. John's and they'll cause a lot of growth. But what jobs are they going to do? Who's employing them? Who's going to pay that wage? We've used the public sector a lot to play that role, hoping that it will sort of prime the pump. But often what happens is it's not attracting the private sector investment behind it. So we need to look at the private sector when we do this thought experiment, not the overall labor market. So the language that we often use is that this is like pushing on a rope in a small open economy if you're going to just add labor to try and get growth. It doesn't work. The capital and you have to get the labor demand, which is the pull factor on the rope to get things moving. And Saskatchewan is an example of where it was demand for commodities that caused the investment, that caused the population growth. So the question is, does Newfoundland have the resource base and the ability to find new export markets to stimulate that labor demand to get this virtuous cycle of population growth going the other way. So the solution is going to come on uh, the export markets by at the end of the day as opposed to your human capital policies. So the value of human capital, we determined this by the way by looking at the impact of return migrants on the New Brunswick economy and what we found is that a New Brunswick worker is worth twice as much in Alberta as they are in New Brunswick, but when they come home, they're worth the same as if they'd never left, and they're worth basically the same increase in pay as anyone who'd never left. So that tells us it's the place, not the person in these economies that matters. We're trying to make the place a more uh, valuable place to work to get the higher return. So migration is going to be driven by labor demand, not human capital policies. Um, well, if you're worried about backfill and churn, you can ignore this slide. If you're worried about growth, you want to be thinking about investment and labor demand, and how do we get that? So Tony's raised a point with me before that if we have immigrants coming in with capital and they're entrepreneurs, maybe that's a solution, and it definitely could be. But you have to think about the scale of that capacity to grow the economy versus just exports of oil, of fish, and all the other abundant resources, which are still important engines in the economies on the East Coast and in the West. The only place where they don't believe resources matter appears to be Ottawa and Toronto. <laughs> so how do we get more investment? Basically, we want to produce and export stuff. We want to find new markets. We want to get better trade deals. I really hope the federal government figures this out soon because I don't know how much time the rest of us have outside of the auto sector. Um, in a lot of cases, I'll get arguments in New Brunswick that it's okay, we'll just get more money from Ottawa. This is, again, just a form of fishing for subsidies as opposed to fish. But it's a way of generating wealth. You want the income from somewhere else. But that's not the same as exporting your lumber into the U.S. market or exporting your oil. Uh, now, policy decisions are important for this. So this example on the bottom is from New Brunswick. All of the things that I believe they're doing to discourage stimulation of exports in the economy and stimulate and uh, disincenting investment in the New Brunswick economy. If you create uncertainty for investors, th they're not sure what their tax rates or labor costs are going to be over the coming five years, they're going to try somewhere else. They're not going to invest and get tie up their capital in your economy. If you have bad policy, you're just going to drive the investment somewhere else. So there's a lot of pressure on government to pay attention to what they need to get investment into the region, and they have to worry about bad policies in other regions that are bad for the wrong reason. Someone's trying to bribe the capital to come in, and you wind up with a really negative game. Are you going to play the bad policy bribery game? 
or how do you get the fundamentals in shape? And so this is where a lot of discussion just comes in on what is your structure of taxes? What is a, what kind of property rights are you going to give for producing? Uh, what kind of guarantees can you bring in in terms of attracting labor or capital? So again, it turns, it's spinning things on its head. We're not thinking about the workers, what they need. We're also thinking about what does business need? And this gets me yelled at a lot in New Brunswick. I just want to say that because apparently business has considered a compromised entity that has to be restrained at every turn. And it is making it a much smaller and comfortable place to live. Now, while we're waiting for export and labor demand to return, if they do, we have some choices to make. So if I'm telling you that we can't control the growth of the economy, that it really depends on we live in a casino to make our income. And right now we're going to pull the arm and hope it gives us a positive oil price this year. At least that's what we did in Alberta. And for 15 years, we just kept pulling that arm. We kept getting more and we were like, woohoo. We built bigger houses, bigger roads, bigger schools. We everything. We kept kicking the can down the road, even though it was predictable that if those prices fell, the province was going to have a problem. If you follow them, they've gone from $14 billion in cash to about $70 billion in deficit. So they've had an $84 billion swing in five years for a population of 4 million. It's one of the poorest managed provinces fiscally in Canadian history. But because they started a positive cash position, everyone thinks they were wonderful. But we started telling them in the 1990s that was going to happen. They didn't want to do anything about it. So what are the choices we have? We can borrow and wait. This is the tried and true Alberta approach. Hope and pray for the return of future resource rents. And that way, nothing has to change. We can just say that our world is OK. We're going to be fine. Those prices are coming back. In the 1980s, it took about 20 years for them to come back. And we got Ralph Klein. And that was the scorch the earth era. So what I'm hoping is we want to avoid scorching the earth again. The second is change or do something so that no matter when those prices come back, we're in a better position. We can afford what we have. What we tend to do with slow growth and population aging type problems is that we ignore that we have a lot of power to adjust in other areas, which is, are we living within our means? Are we really organizing services in the best possible way? And so if we don't have the money now, maybe this is the time to start looking at what's sustainable if the demand never comes back. So we're doing this increasingly on pensions. It's, I think it's called risk sharing, which means if the economy craps out, I don't get paid when I retire. But risk sharing is kind of the model that we need to think about coming back. In the big view, the risk sharing comes through the housing market. If we get everything in order and the oil economy comes back, you'll have much better house prices you will capitalize on those gains. But what can we do to change something? I want to talk about healthcare and fiscal time bombs. Now, the reason I want to bring this up is because we've known about this problem for a really long time. So in the 1990s, we started reforming pensions around population aging, but this was all federally focused. There was no discussion about what's happening in the provinces because pensions were the first thing we started to worry about. But we knew at the time the baby boomers were aging. It wasn't a surprise. We started seeing books like Boom, Bust, and Echo and Lawrence Kotlikoff's Generational Accounting coming in that said we need to do something because we can't pay what we promised to pay as everyone gets older and the tax base gets smaller. So we made some unfortunate historical choices. We chose to use pay-as-you-go finance over funded approaches to public services. If we didn't use pay-as-you-go, population aging wouldn't matter at all because you would have had a compulsory savings component in a tax system that means we've already put the money aside to pay for all these obligations. We've tried to do that with the Canada Pension Plan, but we haven't done it for things like health care, even though Bill Robson at C.D. Howe was calling for that in the 1990s after the CPP reforms. Now, the other decision we made that was really unfortunate is we left provinces responsible for the big ticket item of things like health care. So in other words, we created population aging as a provincial problem, even though we have a federally mobile labor force. So the, this whole idea about who's a Newfoundlander is kind of bizarre. If they stay and have obligations that you have to pay for, they're yours. But if your uh, young people go west, they're not yours anymore. They're Alberta's. And so then we have to start thinking about what's the equalization or transfer scheme that really recognizes that this is a federal system and the needs are going to differ. And again, the federal government doesn't want to go there because they know it requires much more of a transfer to the East, and in particular, taking away some of the transfers they've just been giving to the West. 
by going to things like per capita grants for healthcare as opposed to age adjusted. So again, these pressures are coming. And then the other one is, and universities are guilty of this too, we entrenched entitlements to public resources. So at a time when student demand is declining, universities don't have to give up any of that money. So what we have in the public system is that as demand shifts for what we need, we don't have the capacity to shift the resources from declining demands or needs to increasing demands or needs. So as a result of that, we make everything really expensive. If you look at Atlantic Canada, the, the ratio of students to faculty and universities is about what it was 20 years ago. The cost of a professor is basically doubled. So we're doing the same output at twice the price. And we say, no problem in universities, we're doing good stuff, so let's look at healthcare. But again, these problems are all the way through because there's entitlements. Now this one will get me run out of New Brunswick for sure. <laughs> So we did uh, what I would call let's pretend economics. We just asked the question, what if we really had a sustainable healthcare system where we could obligate everybody to pay the taxes forever, no matter what? And we promised everybody at birth this age spending health profile. So we spend a lot on you when you're less than one. We don't spend much on you until you're about 65 and then it goes up. But when you're born, we promise this to you. And we promise we will tax any Canadian we need to to pay for it. And the way this is gonna work, uh, is that at birth, in net present value, this is equivalent to giving you a lump sum of $35,000 that you can invest. And that will pay for all your healthcare costs over your lifetime with this profile that will not grow. So this is also successful healthcare reform. Healthcare costs aren't increasing other than population ages and I'm going to show. The second thing we're gonna do is we're going to say it's pay as you go. So what matters is we're gonna calculate how much we have to spend on healthcare in the population based on its age structure. And then we're gonna go back and we're gonna figure out how much tax do we need to collect. And we're gonna apportion it basically by your age earnings uh, profile over your life cycle. So we look at how many people are paying taxes, how many are earning high income, how many are lower income. And then we figure out what you pay in that year. And then what we're gonna do is calculate over your lifetime for every birth cohort from 1947, how much over your lifetime you paid in tax for this healthcare asset. So the only thing that's changing year to year is total health spending based on the age structure of the population and how much tax comes out of you because of the changing tax base. Who's a good deal, who gets a good deal out of the healthcare system and who doesn't? And these numbers may never happen, but what they do point to is that the real problem we're gonna have is political sustainability that are your kids really liking you enough to give up a whole bunch of their wealth, as I'm going to show you at birth, just to be Canadian or a Newfoundlander. So these are what age tax profiles look like. The blue line shows that as you get old, you get most of your health care spending late in life. The red line shows that you pay most of your tax between 25 and 54. So what matters in this economy is how many people are between 25 and 54 and how many are over 65. So it's a pretty simple thing, but it turned out computationally it was a little ugly, as I'm gonna show. And remember, we're only gonna have that 1% annual per year for healthcare spending. There's no other inflation in healthcare costs, which have typically been running between two and 5% per year. So we got rid of the big cost driver. You can call it technology or whatever you want, but this is just the population aging based part. Now, what do these age profiles look like? Well, those are the uh, amount of taxes we would collect from each birth cohort by age over their lifetime. So the bottom line, uh, the black one, is if you were born 48 to 57, your peak tax rate there is probably around $5,500 just to meet healthcare uh, obligations. I'm the yellow line, 58 to 67, still not bad at 6,000. My kids are up around the red line. They're going to pay 8,000 to 9,000 at peak for the same asset that I had. So one way to think of this is Canada likes me more than my kids because they're giving me a much better deal on the same asset just because I was born at the right time. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna take the net present value of these age tax profiles and I'm gonna subtract off the healthcare asset value. Or the way I'm gonna do it, it's gonna be the healthcare asset value less what you paid for it. So a positive number means you got a transfer at birth of wealth. We like you so much we gave you money and said go invest it. And if it's a negative, it says, we don't like you. We're taking your wealth now, and you owe us going forward. You're born in debt just to pay for these obligations. So on the left, uh, what I have is, is that Newfoundland? No, that's Canada. 
So Canada, the blue bars is a situation, what it would look like in Canada if we had no immigration. So what this shows is that up until about, oh, I can't even read that. It, but if you were born as late as the late 80s, you were still getting a positive benefit of the healthcare system. It was transferring more money to you than it was taking away. But for anyone born since 1990, you're paying more for this asset than you're getting in its value. And it's declining in value over time. The orange bars add in the last 30 years experience with immigration. We assume that carries on for another 30 years. What you'll see is it just pushes the problem down the road. It doesn't solve it. It just, you know, it's now going to be people born after 2020 that are going to pay, not before. And frankly, what have the unborn done for us lately anyway? <laughs> so it's kicking the can down the road. The gray bars, I want to highlight, if the current generation returned to a fertility rate of 2.0 right now, this problem would go away. But the societal implications of encouraging a fertility rate of 2.0 and what that would mean for labor force participation and what that would mean for changing relationships in society would be pretty massive. So fertility can fix this, but it's not clear how you get a fertility rate in a mature economy of that size. But that's the only fix for it is recreating the mistake of the baby boom we can do this again. Now, Newfoundland is this panel over here. And I realized it got a bit weird because my uh, grad student who was doing this kept referring to immigration. But when we were doing provinces, he really meant migration. So the blue bar is the blue bars are the net taxes. And they're on the same scale as on the left. Yeah. So you can see that there's a bigger problem uh, in Newfoundland after 19, birth cohorts after 1990. Uh, if there's no out migration, you have the blue bars. So population aging is more severe. The birth taxes are quite high for young Newfoundlanders. If we add in the historic experience without migration and that slight decline in population, you get the orange bars. And I had to truncate them to fit on the same scale, but the system explodes. You cannot collect enough tax out of young Newfoundlanders to pay what's been promised. And so effectively, this is insolvent. So the healthcare system under a pay-as-you-go basis cannot pay for itself going forward. Because this is the, le the level of tax you would need to take out of your young population is just unreasonable. Like on the bottom, that's a $15,000 birth tax. You owe, it's like student debt at birth. Are you prepared to impose that on a young population? And it actually goes down to about 55,000 debt at birth just because of the health promises. So... The bigger problem is that even if you did everything to solve that population aging thing, and we talked about different options, making people healthier, trying to pre-fund it, changing the tax arrangement, most of those are too late. We can hope to grow out of it. Even if you solve the population aging part, which is the blue bars up there, the birth taxes and the birth benefits, if we added the 2.5% annual inflation to healthcare spending, we get the red bars, and that biggest one that's out there is an $85,000 birth tax for that uh, cohort, which I think is about 2045 to 2050. So this system is exploding because we can't restrain healthcare spending beyond the population aging component. So if you really want to address uh, things in the meantime while we're waiting for growth to return, we have to return to all of that healthcare reform that we were talking about in the 1990s. How do we make it more sustainable on the spending side? And this is where we have to start taking population aging seriously again, that if we have shifting needs, we've got the wrong healthcare system currently. Hospitals and doctors are, have too much money in them, and we don't have enough money in the other needs like non-medical care in the community. How do we make that shift, which was identified, by the way, as early as 1973 as something that had to happen for this to be a sustainable healthcare system? Canadians aren't very good at addressing these things. And the other thing I want to point out is that these bars where I'm getting a big benefit, so 10,000 at birth was given to me through the healthcare transfer system, that hasn't realized yet. That's not been booked because I haven't collected my healthcare spending yet. If we hit the rocks, that will be rationed. I won't get that. So I can lower those bars by rationing. I can change it by shifting uh, taxation onto people who are retiring. I can take away pensions. And I can just relieve the tax burden on the next generations. So in other words, I don't believe any of these things are going to happen. I think the younger generation is going to say, you're nuts. We're not paying. They're either going to move or they're going to vote baby boomers out of existence. 
and we're going to have to deal with sort of an every one for themselves type healthcare system. So it's really important we think about how to address this. Now, my bottom line and last slide is that we should really be embarrassed about where we are right now as Canadians. We've been run over by a glacier. We've been watching it coming for decades and saying, wow, it's getting closer. And now we're in the middle of it and we don't know what to do about it. So we were gambling the whole time that growth was going to bail us out. You know, things have been pretty good for 15 years. But we had 15 years of growth and we didn't get any better off. We just made everything more expensive. So the problem is now even worse than it was in the 1990s. And anyone who tried to get in the way of the hysteria around the boom that was going on with autos and oil and everything else, you got shouted down. Because the world was never going to see a drop in economic production again. We were all going to do great. So we were going to bail ourselves out. And then what we did is we've created most of our own problems around population aging. The aging of the population is not a problem. How we spend and how we raise money for it is the problem. We can fix those things. But we know that the population is aging. We know what they need. What we're really lousy at is figuring out how are we going to do that because it usually means taking something from someone else to give to someone else. So we have to start thinking about making harder choices. The other thing that we have to recognize is the solutions are already available to us because we've been talking about them for a long time. We just haven't done any of them. So we don't need more studies. We can talk about which trade-offs are palatable to the population, which are acceptable, but we really don't have the scope anymore to say we don't know what to do. And if we don't know what to do, the real risk in a small open economy is that as we get more indebted, someone else is going to tell us what we're going to do instead. And so this is really a question of do we want to retain our policy sovereignty or are we just going to keep living as large as we can, hope we get bailed out and let someone else fix the problem for us in a way that might be like, I don't know if anyone remembers the Klein era, the Mike Harris era, things got pretty ugly for a while. It got really good after it because there was sort of a reset, but in the midst of it, it was not fun and people got hurt. And I think that we have a window of opportunity right now to take a serious look that population aging is real. It can be reversed with things that we can't control, like export demand or world pri global prices for commodities. But we can do a better job of managing what we have to pay for and how we raise our money in the meantime, so that even if that growth comes back, we'll have the conditions to do even better. But I'll cut it off there. And if there's questions, I'm happy to take them. Precedent for the day. Uh, I think we probably have a mic that we can get to people. Uh, any comments, questions? Someone right here, John? Uh, Rick, uh, Richard. <laughs> Say who you are and what you Check. Did you know I'm the uh, Labrador director for municipalities? Um, is there a possibility that the the insufficient numbers of private practices in healthcare is actually driving the cost up, especially in hospitals? This forces a lot of people that do not necessarily need eMERGE to actually show up in hospital, congest the hospital. Um, I was looking at uh, some of the uh, reviews and actually the cost, the total cost seems to be impossible to actually calculate. They do not, uh, for example, for each patient, they do not table how much it costs for an x-ray, how much it costs for uh, uh, latex gloves, how much it costs for, for people that potentially do not necessarily need to be there. Um, it is also known that the older the population, the less they'll, they'll have a tendency to go to emerge, we understand that. But there is an age group, my age, uh, where, for example, we go to sports, we get an injury that potentially can wait. I can call my private practitioner and say, I need, I need to see you. I don't need to go to eMERGE. Unfortunately, today, most of the private practices are full. They can't take any more patients. Is there a solution to this? Oh, absolutely. And there's some studies that are actually out on this. So Janet Curry has recently written one about retail clinics. Uh, that are being run in the United States through pharmacies, where they're often nurse practitioners, not doctors. And she's demonstrated that 
they've diverted, I think just by having these clinics in an area, it diverts about 5% of the traffic to the emergency department. And, you know, primary care, there's been attempts to make uh, primary care doctors more accountable for after hours care. In Alberta, they try to contract with primary care networks. The doctors didn't fulfill it. They just put their answering machines on to say, go to eMERGE. But we know that, that the way that care is organized is inflating the cost by focusing too much use of the hospitals, the emergency departments, and physicians. So again, we can use non-physician non -physician providers for a lot of care. But the big ticket item that we did a lot of looking at as well is just alternative uh, level of care beds. So seniors who are waiting in an acute care bed because there's nowhere to discharge them to. In Alberta, I think it was 600 of those beds in the system are occupied per day, which is equivalent to a full hospital in the big city. And so if you could figure out how to get care into the community, it would be worth about, I think we calculated $500 million per year just in reduced healthcare spending by moving them to a lower cost setting where their needs were met and they're not in the high capital intensive uh, hospital setting, which is about $1,000 a day at least. So the organization of how we do care, the monopolization of the right to provide service on physicians, on things where we do know that nurses can do it, the test that we should really look at is when doctors don't want to go to remote areas and they say a nurse practitioner is fine, we should be looking at what happens to health outcomes with the nurse practitioners versus a physician before. And if we get a null result, that tells us that we have more degrees to substitute. Uh, I've also done work on a wellness clinic that was looking at preventing chronic disease burdens. And we were able to link the program participants to Alberta Health Services, hospital emergency department and GP utilization data. And we found that people in this wellness program, which was largely counseling multivitamins and just access to a care provider, uh, diverted about 15% of traffic of these participants to the emergency departments, about a 20% reduction in hospitalization. And I forget, it's about 10 per five GP visits per week was the average effect if you scaled it to the population. So we know that prevention, we know the care in the community, we know that reorganization, we can make those dollars go a lot further. But what we're doing instead is we keep shoring up the existing system just by adding more money, hoping it will gain better access. And one final point on this, we have doubled the Canadian spending on healthcare since 2001, and it's achieved no gains in access and no improvements in health outcomes. So if we found the resources to double the budget and accomplish nothing, it tells us that we got a lot of money in healthcare that we could probably use a lot more wisely, but there's going to be a lot of fights over that because we're talking about taking someone's entitlement to budget away and giving it to someone else. And as often recognized, we're actually talking about someone's income or someone's job because we need the job somewhere else. Thank you, Herb. Uh, down here, can you introduce yourself? <laughs> uh, Mike Clare, Harris Center. Uh, wonderful presentation, Herb. I, I liked how you took a different perspective on facts we already knew and it opens up uh, you know, new ideas. Uh, I'd like to get your reaction to a comment that was made here on the campus a couple of weeks ago by a, a local investor, in, investment person, uh, Larry Short, who said that we're $15 billion in debt in this province. We're just on the verge of a major downgrade in our bond. Um, two thirds of that debt is owed to outsiders, bonds and all that. A third is debt we owe ourselves, which is mostly pensions. You look at countries like Greece, Ireland, et cetera, when the outside investors re demanded repayment, it, it's the local people that got the haircut. It's the pensions that, it, the public pensions especially, that, that were cut, et cetera. Just trying to get your reaction on, are we there? Um, what, what are your thoughts on that strategy? Well, our next keynote speaker has a lot more expertise on some of these issues than I do. Uh, Richard's written some great books that address these debt issues, but I'll give my own take on it which is, we're not sure if the federal government rides to the rescue, you won't have to take that haircut, but you'll have to accept more controls over what you might do with your budget going forward, or what kinds of uh, contracts are acceptable. So the draconian one is it's all outside investors start dictating how things are going to go. And if you're like the city of Detroit, you actually just default on all the pension obligations. So I would say at this point, there are risks. But there's a lot of moving parts. In the 1930s, the federal government did bail out most of the provinces. Alberta rejected the controls on spending and formally defaulted, although that's still a contested uh, status. 
In other cases, I can point at examples like uh, New Brunswick in the 1950s, Saskatchewan in the 1990s, where international investors did dictate that they had to change their spending and labor contracts in the public sector or the bonds would not be purchased. The biggest problem you face with the downgrades and the interest rates is that I'm not sure what your debt service costs are at this point, but in New Brunswick, they spend as we spend as much on debt service as we do on post-secondary education. So every year, it's almost a billion dollars is just going to pay for services we had in the past. So we couldn't afford it in the past, but we gave it anyway, and now we're using our youth and obligations going forward to pay for it. And that's the rebalancing we have to think about. Now, if it were all Canadians that were the external debt holders, there might be a really interesting discussion to have about just default, that we're just not going to pay it and see what, <laughs> see what comes out. Because Confederation was actually driven by everyone defaulting on their debts and the federal government agreeing to take them on. So one speculation is we might wind up with an Atlantic Union if everyone defaults at the same time, the feds get embarrassed, they take the debt, but we now have a super province. And we can argue where the capital will be and have a conference on that. <laughs> hey, we're eating into our break now. So Tony, quick question, comment? I'll be quick. Uh, Herb, you know, fantastic, very intuitive uh, presentation. And uh, down to the earth, even non-economists, I'm pretty sure they can understand. <laughs> Here, so uh, you, you, I'm really kind of, you know, open to the ideas of how to, you know, generate new demands, new open up new market for exports and so on and so forth. I want to draw a comparison of Australia, for example, very similar to Canada, right, in terms of, you know, resource-based economy, you have small population, immigration programs, so on and so forth. I mean, you know, really they are, you know, in many ways, you know, uh, fishery used to be our largest industry. No, you know, since the, you know, cod, you know, uh, fishing was collapsed. And then we open up new shell fish uh, market. Actually, as we have a lot of um, customers, you know, in big markets like Japan, China, and so on and so forth. I mean, I was in uh, uh, Fogo Island, uh, you know, about two, three, three weeks ago. I mean, you know, they, they got uh, sea cucumbers. I mean, you know, we, we actually have no taste for it. I mean, you know, uh, a lot of Chinese customers love it, right? You know, we have the seal, of course, that's a little bit controversy, the seal product and so on and so forth. The next, actually, the second largest uh, uh, industry after resource uh, industry in Australia is actually higher education, right? They use that as an uh, export market, right? We all know this. I used to teach in Australia. So guess how, how much they charge for one international student? 38,000 Australian dollars a year. And we how much we charge? I think 3,000, 4,000, right? And even you double, triple that, it's much lower. So I think, you know, we, you know in this province, we, we tend to have this kind of, you know, um, give free uh, access to everything, right? Education, resource, and other things. So maybe we should think about, right? You know, uh, the situation like Australia, you know, how to open up this new market in fishery and education and the tourism. We, we, you know, we have, we just mentioned, we're 18,000 beautiful coastlines. And, uh, right, a lot of people would like to come to here to see uh, uh, us. I mean, especially uh, European people, uh, you know, people. I mean, we have actually easy access. Right uh, to London or Dublin, uh, compared with Vancouver. So I think the 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 these demand certainly is there. I think we should really open up uh, our mindsets. I mean, you know, the government can do some their parts. And when I was in Fogo, I mean, people, some fishermen still say we don't want to sell uh, our fish product to foreigners. I'm I'm not sure about the idea. So you know, really, I think it takes time to change the culture. I still strongly believe my major donor's words, Ms. Jaroslawski, he says, economy is the biggest problem in the province, but the most challenging issue is culture transformation. That's the reason why I got a title of cultural economic transformation uh, for the chair. Thank you, Tony. A uh, brief response, sir. Uh, <laughs> so uh, Australia is an interesting counterexample to bring because I've also been down there through their boom and bust, and they're not always sunshine and roses. They made a major reorientation towards trade with Asia, uh, but the whole time they were trying to get trade with the US. We have trade with the US, now we're trying to get trade with Asia. The biggest difference in Australia is they have a federal government, or the, the national government has more control over things like healthcare. They're much more urban. They've killed off most of their uh, rural. 
because everyone lives in big cities down there. And I think the real example you want to look at is Tasmania compared to Newfoundland. And then the final thing I want to say is moving to the east. I don't think culture is the issue. I think that there's incredible, uh, the ability to make something work out of really tough circumstances. So I was reading about the cod stocks were coming back in Newfoundland, but what the interesting part of that story wasn't the cod stocks came back. It was what the fishermen were doing previous to that. They didn't give up. They found something else to do. And so it's always, you know, the spirits there and the effort, it's just someone's got to start throwing some fuel on the fire to give them some help. Because when you take that much effort and that much commitment to a location, it seems like maybe that's an untapped potential. And we need to be thinking about more about the people and what they can bring as opposed to, uh, you know, we're just going to look for the next big thing like sprung cucumber farms as opposed to sea cucumbers. So Alberta's had a lot of these gaps as well in Saskatchewan, but the remarkable thing is when you go and look at what people do to make a go of it uh, in these provinces, that's something you don't see in places like Ontario the same way. So I think culturally, I don't think there's a problem with people having the wrong attitude. I think the great culture, tough place to make a go of it. The question is, can you make it easier for them? Thank you, Herb. Great, uh, great opening. Superb start and uh, lots of positive response to Herb's uh, opening presentation. And he's going to join our panel. He won't get to have a five minute upfront uh, presentation like the panel, but then he'll uh, join in in the QA. We have a really great cross section of folks here. Uh, delighted to have John Abbott, Deputy Minister of Health and Community Services, former member of the Harris Center Advisory Board. I know he puts that first on his CV. Uh, with the Government of Newfoundland Labrador, a position he has held from, uh, he held from 2004 to 2007. Uh, John's distinguished work as a public sector executive earned him the Institute of Public Admin of Canada's Newfoundland Labrador Division, Lieutenant Governor Award of Excellence in Public Admin in 1999. In 2012, Canadian Mental Health Association of Newfoundland Labrador awarded him the Dr. Clarence Pottle Award for Outstanding Service to Furthering Mental Health in the Province. And John has held several Deputy Minister positions over the years in the provincial government uh, and is a committed public policy practitioner. So we're really delighted to have him here. Deidre Ayer is Head of Operations at Other Ocean Group, a video game design firm with studios in California. Prince Edward Island, and here in St. John's. She is also Vice President of Newfoundland Labrador Interactive Media Alliance and a member of the Advisory Committee for PEI's Entrepreneurial Launchpad Program. Deidre is recognized for her commitment to economic and social diversification, her collaborative efforts with educational institutions, typified here today, and her success in recruiting top talent from around the world. When we talk about growing our economy, we couldn't have anyone better than Deidre here. Stephen Bornstein. Dr. Stephen Bornstein has been the director of the Newfoundland Labrador Center for Applied Health Research since it was established in 1999. At NLCAHR, he leads the Contextualized Health Research Synthesis Program, an integrated knowledge translation program that addresses pressing health services policy and technology questions for the provincial health system. We think we're pretty hot at the Harris Center. We often look to Stephen for models of how to do this kind of knowledge mobilization, policy synthesis, connecting with the community, connecting with government. So it's, uh, and in fact, Stephen did some of the early work that led to the, what became the Harris Center. He's also co-director of SafetyNet, Memorial University Center for Research on Occupational Health and Safety. And Stephen also has a background in government, which is not mentioned here, but certainly helpful in, in this discussion. And I'm sorry, I should have checked ahead of time. Apologies. Derek Messicar okay. is a research analyst at StatsCan and an adjunct professor at Memorial. He is an empirical microeconomist with research spanning topics on the economics of aging, pensions, saving, taxation, labor markets, and behavioral public finance. So awesome combination of skills and knowledge here. 
and we'll start in the order I introduce you folks. And John, five minutes. I think we'll keep you at save on time if that's okay with you. Good. Well, good morning, everyone, and thanks for uh, this opportunity. Um, I guess I'm. Uh, I'll be the spokesperson now for the uh, for the health uh, the health sector and, and the health uh, implications of of uh, what uh, Herb uh, presented, which I found uh, uh, quite good, quite succinct, and uh, and I think uh, appreciative of really where we are in uh, in this province. Uh, so he, his last slide there, we talked about we're getting run over by a glacier. Well, <laughs> from that's, you know, if, if taking his macro uh, uh, theme or pr uh, uh, presentation. And I would say, you know, you could say the same about the, the health uh, the health piece uh, uh, in particular. Now, whether it's a bigger iceberg, a smaller iceberg, or bergy bits, I don't know, but it's probably, <laughs> Uh, it's probably, a, 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 you know, an equivalent uh, an analogy to make. Uh, you know, we have seen and know for you know, umpteen years uh, and have predicted where we are today uh, in Newfoundland, in Canada, and uh, certainly internationally. I mean, we draw in terms of our work in the department um, all the data that's, that's there, all the analysis that's there, uh, and I think we have a good appreciation of the, the challenges that uh, we currently face and will face you know, for some time to come. So what we've done as an exercise, for instance, so in, in Newfoundland, we're spending 27, 28% more per capita on healthcare than any, you know, than the national average. Uh, so in, and again, to Herb's point, our outcomes are, you know, not only not, not even at the national average, they are uh, certainly most of the key indicators less and significantly less or worse uh, than what we should be and need to be. Uh, so we've got, you know, a lot of cultural change to make in, in, in terms of our, our health and how we live and how we can live a much healthier life uh, lifestyles. And again, we know all of that, but we're not doing it. And uh, you just need to go uh, just walk around uh, any hospital, any mall, anywhere, and you'll see evidence of uh, very unhealthy uh, lifestyles and results thereof. So anyway, we did an exercise this uh, past winter to see where we quantify that, uh, that, differ that differential and what that would mean and what we could do about it and what changes we would have to make. Uh, because we talk about it, but I like to quantify it and then put it in front of people and think about it and talk about it and where possible make some decisions. So we look at our, what our drivers of our costs, just looking at the cost side of things. So our hospital costs are uh, among the highest. We have uh, more nurses than any other jurisdiction per capita. We have more, believe it or not, we have more doctors than most other provinces per capita. Uh, so but it speaks to why, you, why do we still have to wait uh, to get to see a family doctor. So we got issues in how how they perform and how they uh, and their productivity and issues like that. So anyway, we've got we went right through the spectrum to to cost. So we know within our system where we need and can pull out cost. The challenge for us now, as a department and as as part of the government, is to find acceptance of that change and the need to change. Uh, whether it's with the provider community, and they will say yes but it's over there. Uh, our nurses are out with a campaign right now. We need more nurses. And you know, you gotta listen to what they're saying and why, uh, but they're speaking to a particular problem that they've identified within the, the delivery of nursing care in this province, but their solution is more nurses. Uh, I wouldn't say that is the solution. Uh, our physicians are looking, again, for more to cover more, uh, to be paid more, uh, you know, as an example. So we are looking at, in a practical way, we're looking at all the scopes of practice of all our providers and who can do what job and who can do it best and who can do it at a, a lesser cost and give us the same, if not better, care. So we, we, we're mapping that out. We're looking at uh, the, uh, the whole issue we mentioned, Herb, about the uh, alternate level of care for those sort of patients in our hospitals that really should not be there, should, in many cases shouldn't be there in the first instance, but you know, obviously they're there, and how we can move them uh, either home or to uh, 
personal care home, uh, assisted living, nursing home bed uh, sooner, faster. And we have that mapped out and we're doing a lot of work in that area. And actually, we have really been putting a push on over the past year and we're seeing some significant change there. So we know we have to invest at the community level. We, so bottom line is we need to take all the best evidence, apply it, and then see where we go. So tomorrow, we, for instance, uh, we're looking at, uh, we have a, a sponsored by CIHR, uh, and we are looking at our mental health system in the province and how we use the step care approach, which basically says, you know, you, you, you go to the, the, you know, as patients present themselves, and the classic here is you go to your family physician, he or she says, yes, I'll refer you to a psychiatrist, and you're on a wait list for two years. Now, what happens in those next two minutes, two days, you know, two months, two years? Obviously, you've lost that patient. Uh, so we are now coming, going back to square one on that. So we need to do a lot of reform. We need to uh, need acceptance of that reform, and we have to achieve it, or else we are going to be in you know serious trouble as a province, financially, fiscally, and otherwise, because we are 35, 40 percent of the budget. Uh, and we need to be seen as uh, bringing our cost down. We've been fortunate over the past three years that we've been able to stabilize our budget at basically zero growth. Uh, and we need to literally ratchet that down over the next uh, next five to ten years. And that's what we're uh, working on right now. Okay. Thank you, John. Deidre. Thank you. Um, so. I'm not going to talk about any of that. <laughs> Good. <laughs> I think the best way to um, position uh, what I can contribute here today is uh, to, to give you a, a little bit of the story of our company. So um, my brother, Andrew, was the founder of our company, but he first started in the video game industry in 1991 after uh, leaving Newfoundland. Uh, to go to college in uh, the US. Um, he decided to stay in America to follow his dreams. And um, he did that by chasing a girl to California uh, who was attending Berkeley Law School. And while he was there, um, after my father had spent considerable money on a Harvard education, um, dad told Andrew that it was probably a pretty good idea for him to get a job. So. <laughs> Um, so he was there, you know, it was the late 80s, and at that time, and he thought, okay, this, this whole Silicon Valley thing sounds pretty cool. So um, he got together with some other people, and they founded a software development company. They actually didn't really know exactly what they were going to develop. It seemed like that's what the smart people were doing, and he was pretty smart. So um, fast forward, 1991, he... Uh, founded his first video game development company. And um, he ended up through various mergers and acquisitions and getting together with old college roommates and such, um, developing that company uh, into the largest independent video game developer in North America um, with about a thousand employees and I think 11 studios at its peak. Um, somewhere around, so now now we're gonna fast forward some more and we're, we're at uh, 2005 or 2000, yeah, 2005. And I was visiting him in California and his family. Um, by that time, he was no longer with the girl from Berkeley Law School. Um, fortunately, he was with um, a woman that he had met here in Newfoundland, a friend of mine. Uh, she was actually from Nova Scotia, but was living here in uh, Newfoundland and living with me. And uh, so, so we got him married off to a, an Atlantic Canadian, which was great. Um, and they now have three children. So I was out visiting them in 2005. and. Um, as we tend to do, um, you know, time difference and such, stay up late at night and drink beer. And we started talking about, um, you know, was it actually possible to make video games in Atlantic Canada? And um, so I guess what I'm touching on here is investment. And, um, and through this uh, story that I'll try and fast forward again through, I, I, I think it's important to mention that, um, all the things that have made us successful have to do with investment and partnership and immigration and migration and retention and skills development and education and innovation. And um, so 
you know, we, we touch on a lot of the, a lot of the boxes that everybody's talking about these days. So, um, in our discussion uh, at three o'clock in the morning, you know, we, we thought maybe we could do this in Atlantic Canada, and and Andrew believed very strongly um, that you know, I mean, he was he'd been away for a long time, but he he himself had had been uh, part of the brain drain and out migration from the region, and he thought like, can't you know, can't we do this? Can't we you know, why why can't we do this? Our family had been successful in Newfoundland and Labrador for several hundred years, and you know, he felt strongly that that there were good, strong people here who could do technical, creative work. So um, he hired me to write the business plan and do the due diligence, and um, I traveled around Atlantic Canada and spoke to the various provinces, and and actually settled on Prince Edward Island to open our first studio. But in doing the due diligence, it became clear that you know what we were embarking on was actually you know extremely challenging, um, and uh, and what was going to be the most challenging part was. Uh, the skills issue and finding the right talent and there was virtually no industry in Atlantic Canada there were one or two companies doing what we were talking about doing and operating at a global scale which was pretty much what we uh, had intended to do because that's what Andrew was already doing so um, we set out um, you know we, we made the decision we were going to do this and I set out and and basically traveled the world um, looking for skilled talent that that I felt um, in our interviews, we had to find people who were, who were not only experienced and and talented in the area that we needed, but also people who I thought would, would make Atlantic Canada home and who would stay here and help me, um, mentor and ev eventually be able to hire, um, Atlantic Canada, Atlantic Canadians. Um, we were fortunate enough to find those people, but what really made it all work was was the partnerships that we had with provincial and federal governments in, well, initially in Prince Edward Island. And I'll probably use that example more today than Newfoundland and Labrador, because frankly, we have had more success over there. Um, and, uh, you know, in our first meetings with, with the province and PEI, they had the federal government, they had UPI, they had Holland College, they had, um, you know, people involved in immigration, everybody at the table from the onset working toward the same goal. Um, and since my time is is running out, I will just say that, that that particular studio that we started in 2007 was acquired by Electronic Arts, which is, um, you know, one of the largest and um, most powerful video game companies in the world. And it was hired, or it was, it was uh, acquired specifically for the talent um, that that we had brought to PEI and to the talent that we had fostered locally. So I'll end it at that because my time is up, but we can talk more. And okay, um, when I agreed to be on this panel, uh, I figured what we'd end up with is a fight. Because I saw that the keynote speaker was an economist from Alberta. <laughs> Even worse, an economist from Calgary. So I figured what we were going to have is a big political fight about slashing and burning in the healthcare system. Uh, and I particularly was alarmed by his use of the term entitlements, which is not really a Canadian term. It's American Republican language for slashing the tiny amount of funding they have for what they call a welfare state. Uh, it turns out that that's not what he's saying at all. So basically, well, we have many more agreements than disagreements. I agree with them completely that the economic and fiscal outlook for Newfoundland, uh, Atlantic Canada, and perhaps the Canada as a whole is not good. Um, however, I'm not as afraid of icebergs as he is, because you can actually use ropes on icebergs. Um, <clears throat> I agree with him as well that Immigration is not the solution. You can quadruple the number of immigrants here, and you won't change the financial structures that he has analyzed so well uh, by very much. Uh, aging is a problem, but it's not the essence of the problem. And insofar as it's a problem, it's not a problem on the health spending side. It's a problem on the funding the entire government envelope side because uh, people who don't work uh, don't have 
uh, resources to pay. Um, aging is a problem. Uh, it's a problem for all sorts of features of our healthcare system, but it's not aging itself, it's dying. The, mon the, the biggest expenditure for old people is the same as the biggest expenditure for young people. It's the last year of their life and particularly the last weeks. Um, there are solutions to that and they're not, it's not putting people out on ice floes. Okay, because as a member of the baby boom generation, I do not want to go out on, on, on ice floe, but we can produce, we can produce much more intelligent and effective and humane ways of dealing with people as they are dying that don't necessarily involve spending a huge amount of money. Uh, the real problem is that on the health spending side is that our healthcare system is extraordinarily expensive. We are trying to run a European style healthcare system with an American style funding scheme. And that really doesn't work. We've been trying to fix that for years, uh, but we haven't gotten there. We're still paying doctors the way the Americans pay doctors at rates that are roughly equivalent to what doctors get. We're still overusing doctors and underusing a whole range of other health professionals, particularly nurse practitioners, but also pharmacists, although we've changed some of that. Uh, our system is profoundly inefficient across Canada. Uh, Newfoundland's is worse uh, for some good reasons and some bad reasons. The good reasons, stuff we can't do anything about. You can't change the population structure very easily. Uh, you can't change the distribution of the population in the province. We tried that. Uh, you see the boats being dragged across the waters. That's probably not a solution either to any extent. We have to figure out how to run our current healthcare system more efficiently and effectively. And it doesn't necessarily involve contraction. It may in fact involve expansion because you will know we're the only publicly funded healthcare system in the world that does not pay for pharmaceutical products. If we did, we would actually save a lot of money. We'd not be saving so much money from the public sector. We'd be saving money from the national economy. Um, so there, there are ways to save money. Tax reform may be one of them, but I don't understand how you can structure a tax system so that people at different ages pay at different rates. Maybe you have a solution that I don't get it. But there are all sorts of ways to save money within our current health system. And John and I are actually working on it. We have a research exchange group at the center that I run uh, on cost and value in healthcare, considering how we could do what we're currently doing and even more, but spend less on it. And partly there are big techno technological fixes out there uh, in computerized health services, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, remote services a whole range of things that could be used to cut down the spending problem. Whether it helps the financial problem, I'm not so sure, but I'll leave that to the economists. Thank you. Stephen, and last on the panel, Derek. So first and foremost, uh, being an economist from Ottawa, uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll try not to uh, start a debate too much, but on that note, let me say first and foremost, thank you very much. Uh, in both languages, I'll say first and foremost, thank you very much for the invitation to be here. Uh, merci pour l'invitation d'être ici aujourd'hui. Uh, and I'll just start with a couple of quick notes on the presentation that we heard from Dr. Emery there, and then I'll just say a few more general comments. So first, I wanted to say, uh, I really did like the emphasis that we heard today on this open versus closed economy concept. I think that's particularly important in Canada, and not only from the wage to capital ratio that we heard today, but also from, from, from other perspectives as well. And one that comes to mind is uh, income taxation. Uh, if we if we approach income taxation from sort of a closed economy approach, then I don't think we're getting the full scope and, and dynamics that we would necessarily expect to see. So a good example that would be Michael Smart from the University of Toronto who came out here a couple of weeks ago uh, through the CARE program at, uh, at Memorial and, and talked about uh, interprovincial competition in taxation and that when, when we increase taxation at the higher end, when we create new tax brackets at the higher end, uh, people have the option of moving. They, they can pick up and move locations themselves. They can relocate across provinces. 
um, they can also re redirect and reinvest their funding in other ways to try to alleviate some of some of that additional taxation. So that's something that also comes to mind in terms of of, of what we need to be considering from sort of an open economy perspective. Uh, I also wanted to emphasize this 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 idea of pay as you go. We heard talk of pay as you go with the Canada Pension Plan. Uh, some of you may know that the Canada Pension Plan went through significant reforms back in 1998. Uh, we saw very modest reductions in benefit eligibility, but at the same time, significant increases, basically a doubling of contribution rates by employers and employees into these plans. And we basically moved the Canada Pension Plan away from a pay-as-you-go system to a fully funded system and significantly increased the solvency of these programs. So what I think is really uh, interesting and important to emphasize from this is that it does show change can happen, reforms can happen, things we can do to, uh, to increase the solvency of these programs programs. Uh, just more generally, I wanted to say um, this this population aging, you know, it's, it's sort of an umbrella term for, for several different effects that are happening, happening simultaneously. We have the cohort effect where the baby boom generation is moving into retirement. We have this migration effect, so out migration of, of younger workers in search of better jobs. Uh, older workers are also coming back to retire so that, you know, they spent a lifetime uh, contributing to other provinces um, tax systems and then come back to draw uh, from local local uh, you know pension programs and so on and so forth. Uh, but there's also this this life expectancy effect that simply people are living a lot longer than they used to in the past. And if you look at it about 50 years ago, the average life expectancy has gone up by about 10 years for men and women. So this isn't just a couple of years we're talking about. This is quite significant. And if we look at how today's retirees are faring, uh, we see that they have a replacement income rates in retirement of about 60 to 80 percent of the income that they had in their normal working years. So they were really, you know, they're, they're doing pretty well on average. Uh, this is coming from generous public pension programs, but it's also coming from relatively high enrollments in traditional or defined benefit workplace pension plans. What we're also seeing is that employers are moving away from offering these traditional, these defined benefit programs, and the onus to save is increasingly being left entirely to workers. Uh, to prepare for their retirement is being increasingly left to this younger generation. And, and really the, the, um, the comfortable living standards of today's retirees make it hard to call attention to how uh, much challenges younger workers are expected to face when they do reach the age of retirement eventually. Um, I mentioned the, uh, the increase in life expectancy. One thing to note is that through the reforms of the Canada Pension Plan, uh, we didn't see changes in the age of benefit eligibility. So the benefit eligibility state was at 65, it remains at 65. And, and so really when we see declines in private savings rates but increases in public uh, spending on public pension programs, the net effect of that is not entirely clear. There's an ambiguous net effect here as to whether younger generations are expected to do well. Um, and, and I'll just conclude by saying, uh, really this raises the question of the ability to work of, of, of older workers. Uh, Tammy Shirley, Kevin Milligan, and a few other economists from, from Ontario and British Columbia have done studies looking at the ability of older workers to continue to work um, once they reach sort of the age of normal retirement, so once they reach the age of 65 and, and, and over. And what we see is that, or at least what they've found, is that people tend to have, in terms of at least the health capacity to work, about an additional five years beyond what they're actually doing. So there does appear to be um, a capacity to continue to remain in the labor market beyond what we're actually seeing. And to, to address the issue of, of taxation in ways that you could reduce the um, sort of the burden of remaining in the labor market and, and to increase the tax base for, for older workers uh, to, to continue to be in the labor market, one thing that comes to mind is age-dependent taxation. And so uh, age-dependent uh, deductions and other forms of, of uh, age-related um, tax and transfer programs that could help workers stay in the workforce longer. Thank you. Thank you, Derek. So loads more insights, angles on what we're dealing with here, multifaceted. I'm gonna let Herb have a few words before we finish, but does anyone have a comment, question? And we'll get the mic up here at the front and you can address it to a particular panelist or they can all weigh in or whoever feels like it can weigh in. Um, my question is for uh, everyone, but particularly it's John, eh? Yes. And Mr. Borns? Borns? Stephen. Stephen. Um, the, um, uh, well, uh, how could I ask this simply? I agree with you uh, with a lot of what you said in terms of the um, the, the dynamics of, of uh, costs and uh, age, and particularly with respect to the fact that much of the curves that we see 
when we start looking at uh, a popula age uh, spending by uh, age uh, spending by age group on healthcare, we see that um, uh, from 65 and above, you no longer have a linear growth; you have an exponential growth. But much of that is related to the fact that mortality rates are going up. Um, so, two questions. Well, first of all, in our region, we have uh, right now we have one out of five people who are 65 and above. In 20 years from so now, it's estimated it will be close to one out of three. So we'll have about twice as many people, uh, unfortunately, facing the event of death than in the rest of Canada. So that in and of itself means that we should be focusing even more on novel ways to reduce spending in that in that uh, uh, for that particular sad eventuality. The other question I'd have for you is, what's the role of chronic conditions in that uh, age-intensive spending? John, do you want to start? Go ahead. Oh. Go ahead. OK, uh, quickly, chronic conditions are a crucial issue, but they stretch out. You know, some people start with a chronic condition at 12. Um, at some level, you can call cancer now that we're getting better at keeping people alive a chronic condition. So it has, it has less to do with aging than you might think, although people aging and the prevalence of chronic conditions do vary together. So yes, it is a problem. We are getting better at dealing with chronic conditions, um, uh, making, basically making a lot of conditions that were acute into chronic ones, but also we're getting better at treating people with chronic conditions. Um, what we do about the cost of death, uh, I mean, partly it's community-based palliative care. For the moment, we have very expensive palliative care because we insist on bringing people into the hospital and wiring them up and spending a huge amount of money in their last two weeks of life. Uh, if we got better at leaving people, sending people back home with really sophisticated community-based visiting care, uh, we would spend a lot less money as people die. Uh, I would also point out that uh, the irony of this um, uh, extended uh, life expectancies is that Newfoundland's is not that high because our health status is lousy. So Newfoundlanders die about three years earlier than the average Canadian, which in a way saves us some money. <laughs> There's an upside to everything. <laughs> John, I don't think you'll be promoting that, no, but... No. Uh... Yes, uh, come here and die earlier. <laughs> at home. Well, well, at home. At home. My dad lived yeah. by the motto, live fast, die young, and leave a good looking corpse. Yeah. And yeah. he achieved that, so I don't know. Yeah, Sorry. Yeah, yeah, no, uh, <laughs> Tara said, "There's not much I can add to what Stephen said, but we are we are focused on, the, the, you know, sort of breaking this down to a cohort. So we are focusing on end of life care, uh, and I mean, we had a we have a particular program that says we will provide you supports up to 28 days. So on the assumption that you're going to die on the 28th day. Now that you know, so we got." In, you know, barriers within our programming and our servicing. Uh, we have community health nursing, you know, very competent, but that's okay until four o'clock Friday. So what happens <clears throat> that night, that weekend? So we have a lot of systematic barriers that we have to knock down, that we are working on knocking down. Now we have to engage, you know, the, the structure of our workforce. So we have to engage the nursing union physicians to change their practice. Uh, and sounds easy, but it takes a lot, uh, a lot of conversations and a lot of uh, arm twisting at times to do what we all know needs to be done. So we're at that stage in a lot of that programming that needs to change. Now we're well behind and we need to catch up and accelerate because you know we, we have all the numbers, we know who's coming you know, literally down the pipe and we uh, we had to figure out how we can intervene earlier. Uh, we're doing, using technology, so remote patient monitoring will help us with managing people with chronic disease, people with dementia. So we can do that from home with the appropriate technology. Because once the person gets in the car, goes to the doctor, gets the visit, gets the prescription, gets the, you know, the referral, it's just a, a spiral. And 
we have to intervene right right from the from the get go, and that's sort of where we're where we're focusing our efforts uh, right now. Anyone else on the panel want to jump in on this one? Herb, you're allowed to speak on this point now. I'll save your other thoughts for later. So the, just one comment I'll, I'll make is that, uh, well, I'll make two. One is that I've presented before to a bunch of former deputy ministers of health, mm -hmm. and I was presenting similar kinds of things on what we can do with reform, and then the one guy puts his hand up and he says, we can't afford all these health savings you're offering. <laughs> and the point he was making is that there's no money available in the current budget. Every dollar is accounted for and spent. And so the challenge that starts to come in is that if you see a better way or you want to foster innovation in how things are done, there has to be a different financing model so that you can somehow front the transition because there's going to be costs to be borne and you can't just keep raising taxes in the short run. So the Naylor panel was all about that to some degree, which was to sort of look for the promising pilots, figure out how to get a pool of capital to front those to scale and spread. And even on the IT type things, the big challenge for the region is how do you scale and spread? What do you need to really uh, foster that? And that's what I would call a, a knowledge gap right now in the Atlantic Canadian policy discussion is from employers, from firms. Tell us what would be high impact changes that could be made so that the multinational company says, we want to expand in St. John, not in Seattle or something along those lines. One other observation is we do have ice flows. One of the most remarkable and repugnant uh, policy changes in health because it was conflating healthcare costs, the cost of dying, with an ethical issue, assisted dying. We moved quicker on assisted death than I've seen on any other element of healthcare reform. Mm -hmm. And even the most difficult issues, like what do you do with people with mental health issues, weren't being addressed. This whole legalization of cannabis with no discussion about the mental health budget coming in with it is just another example of where they're not thinking about the big picture and they're going to leave the provinces saddled with if mental health becomes a problem we've got bigger issues coming down the road because our system currently is awful for mental health and addiction it does bring up one point you made that i i also agree with you on is that this is a federal provincial issue much of the change that you want to introduce will have to be done at the provincial level but you can't violate the basic principles of the Canada Health Act. And you also shouldn't have to do all the invention in a tiny little province, rather than having much more interprovincial collaboration on the side of health innovation than we currently uh, seem to manage to be able to do. We have to be talking to people in Alberta and BC and Ontario. Alberta had a solution for a while to your problem of how to fund health innovation. It's using oil money in the, the foundation that they used to have. They've killed that. Uh, Norway has a solution, but uh, the rest of Canada doesn't. So to, a quick point on that, because we did work, uh, the Prentice government before they fell to the Notley government had proposed to eliminate the Alberta Heritage Foundation for Medical Research because the logic that came out of Stephen Duckett, the health economist from Australia, was why would any jurisdiction invest in its own innovation when you can import ideas for free? <laughs> and they wanted to move all the money into frontline service. So at a time where we needed that capacity to do that kind of reform, provincial governments were actually going the other way to resource the frontline care. So we don't resource innovation. I'd like to, I'd like to respond to your quick comment about getting high tech companies to expand in St. John, and I'm gonna change it to St. John's. And, <laughs> and not Local Seattle. <laughs> Careful, buddy. <laughs> and not Seattle. Um, well, actually, that's already happening. So you've got Ubisoft, who is set up in Halifax, um, Ubisoft and Electronic Arts in, in Charlottetown. So I can tell you, 10 years ago, nobody would have ever dreamed the way that was never going to happen. Um, and the reason that it happened was because um, the provinces and the educational institutions um, and and the smaller companies like ours and the startups came together and uh, partnered together, um, worked together on immigration programs, worked together on skills development. Um, the companies actually went into the um, educational institutions and helped with curriculum development and developing modules and actually teaching those programs. and. Um, 
So it, 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 it is actually happening. It's happening you know, in, a, in a small way that, that is not always so noticeable. But if you look at Charlottetown, they've actually got what I would call a, a micro cluster. Um, you know, the federal government talks about super clusters and um, but Charlottetown is a really good example of, of all the stakeholders coming together and working together. There's, there are 200 video game um, developers in Charlottetown. I mean, that may not sound like a whole lot, but you're talking about a population of 30,000 people. Mm -hmm. And you're talking about a place that has suffered from out migration and brain drain. And um, so, you know, and that, that all really started out of like, nothing like you know a few people sitting around a table with with a pipe dream um and getting one good anchor company uh, like ours um and we were able to to encourage other uh, basically we were able to encourage other startups um and uh and and through the help of, of bringing in um immigrants who had a real propensity for mentorship and bought into what we were doing and i think also in Charlottetown at that time, because we're talking like 2006, 2007, like before the global collapse, but you know, also before like the invention of the iPhone, um, they were leaving large centers because they wanted they wanted to do they wanted to go say back to like a smaller development studio, but where they could have a, a really different style of living. We didn't need to attract everybody from all over the world who was a really good video game developer. We only needed to attract a few people to help us start that, and. Um, by working together, we were able to do it. So uh, these larger companies are coming in and buying those up, right? I mean, that's what they're doing. They're not coming in and starting from scratch. They're coming in and they're buying those startups. And um, so, you know, there's a model there and there, that's a model that, that for, for Newfoundland and Labrador, we, we've been trying, you know, we've been at this for eight years or so here. Um, it's been far more difficult to get everybody at the table. Um, plus we were also fighting at the time um, such an, and you sort of touched on this. I mean, everybody was so focused on oil, we couldn't get anyone to pay any attention to what we were doing. And um, we played second fiddle on everything, right down to, to you know, trying to get temporary foreign workers in. Um, we would literally be told um, by Service Canada, well, you know, you're going to the bottom of the pile because such and such an oil company, uh, you know, needs us to get their, I mean, it was probably something very important, probably something to do with safety. I don't know, but it wasn't helpful to us. So, um, yeah, I mean, it, it is it is happening. I mean, it's, it's sort of hard to believe. I, I wake up every morning thinking, oh my God, Ubisoft's in Halifax. Like, how did that happen? And how did how did Electronic Arts end up in Charlottetown? But it can happen. Thank you. Uh, Mike has a question, I think. Uh, my question was for Deidre. When I asked for the microphone, you hadn't spoken yet. Hi, you, you've <laughs> answered about 75% of my question. Yeah. Uh, what can Memorial, CNA, the provincial government do? Because you mentioned that it was yeah. so much easier on PEI. Yeah. And why it's so difficult here. Sure. What, what can we do here to make yeah. your life easier? Yeah. So, um, I mean, we, we have had positive relationships. Um, I think in PEI it was easier because, frankly, the place is a fifth the size. Um, so, you know, it was just easier to get everyone at the table. They didn't, and they also didn't have, like I said, you know, they weren't, they weren't, uh, we weren't competing um against such a, a massive industry that was creating such large scale um, employment. So it's actually easier for us now to get everyone to the table. So we're just, we're just behind, I think. I don't, I don't think it's impossible, we're just behind. Um, we didn't have, there's, there's now a provincial government tax credit too. Um, I know not everybody loves tax credits or, or agrees with tax credits, but that in our industry, that's, that's the reality. That's, you know, I'm competing against other companies and other jurisdictions that are getting tax credits. So that, that's, you know, that's part of, um, of our economic model. It needs to be because of, of who we compete against. Um, we do have, we do have a, a digital media tax credit in Newfoundland and Labrador. It's been a little hard getting off the ground. There's been some red tape, but um, everybody is, is working together now than than certainly a few years ago so um and, and we do have good relationships with uh with the university and uh with college of the north atlantic um one thing i, I would mention though is that we've we've also had um we've there's also been some 
I think the educational institutions and, and also other companies that maybe are not as engaged in immigration as, as our company is need to make sure they cast their net a little further when they're hiring because often they're taking from us and poaching from us. And I don't think it's necessary. I think they can find people, uh, you know, not necessarily in in their garden, you know, like cast the net a little further and let's bring more people in with these skills. And these, these are positions that are open. Um, you know, we're not needing to create them. Uh, they're there. Um, we don't need to, to just keep hiring people from within. I mean, if somebody's going after a job and they want that and they want to leave my company, that's fine. But aggressively poaching, it's not helpful. And that, that was also something that we were able to really um, work with other companies and the educational institutions in PEI. Um, we worked really closely with them to make sure we weren't poaching from each other and, and that we were casting the net further. Any other? I have to do something about the, what I think is a myth that the oil industry is a big job creator. The health sector is a big job creator, mm. frankly. Uh, oil, if the price goes up, most of the jobs will end up in Alberta. They won't end up here. The offshore platforms do not employ many people. Um, so we need to think about the kinds of economic activity that are not resource-based. So we, are, we don't continue to be the hewer of wood and drawer of water for the rest of the world. Other, yep. Thank you. Yes, good day, thank you. This is an excellent discussion, I'm, I'm learning a lot. Uh, on the heels of what Stephen was just speaking to, I, I couldn't help but notice that uh, the uh, government policies uh, one of the first things that was on the list was the fracking ban. And certainly, I, I personally don't see that this is kind of the solution that we're looking for, uh, for certainly the west coast of, of the province, uh, when we're talking about a resource, a tourism-based resource that is unbelievable, and an ecotourism sustainable resource. Now, I'm, I'm St. John's representative, so here I am talking about the west coast, but the reality is I don't just give a damn about St. John's, I give a damn about our province. Um, so uh, I just want to make that one point right there that I think that there are a number of different ways that we can help. It's not going to be the big win. It's not that big basket full of eggs and such that's just going to happen. But I do think that there are sustainable ways that we need to invest uh, uh, in terms of economic development. Mm -hmm. Certainly IT, you know, is, is certainly is Deidre's business as well. You know, th these kind of industries certainly. But cultural and ecotourism obviously is a huge asset that we have. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of improvements that we can certainly make there as well. Um, the one thing that I, well, there's two things that other things that I wanted to comment on. Uh, one is I just want to find out what the status is on midwifery. If we're talking about cost effectiveness um, for our health system, there's been a, a decades long um, effort to try to legislate midwifery in our province, mm -hmm. uh, which could bring down costs of actually birthing. And I was trying to find costing of how, what it actually costs to uh, have a baby. Uh, in our province, and I, I couldn't really find any accurate figures there quickly. But I do know that there are there are other ways to approach, um, you know, the cost of the cost of that that particular aspect of healthcare. Um, so I guess I asked that question, and of course, John, you and I, of course, you know, share a common interest in in mental health advocacy, and um, I know that we that's an uh, that's an ever growing need in our in our community as well. So I just wondered if you could comment on maybe those two, John. Uh, specifically yeah. well uh, uh, Sheila as you were speaking I said now for full yeah. disclosure on your part I believe your mother's family is from the West Coast yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. just 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 to help out uh, her, her winning response that's all <laughs> uh, but I'm midwifery we're well behind you know it's it's you know it, it, that being said we now do have a consultant in the department who is now out in the field uh, recruiting developing programming and uh, our, you know her biggest challenge, she will tell you, is engaging the physicians and to let go, because there are others that can do this uh, much, probably much more effectively and yeah. and willingly. <laughs> yeah. So and yes, and from a cost point of view, yeah. so uh, that's uh, that's uh, definitely accepted. And certainly on mental health, and one of the points uh, that uh, with the new federal dollars that are coming into the province, albeit not large. But we are using those dollars to really uh, to kickstart the transformation. Uh, you know, we have our action plan. You know, as a result of the all-party committee process, so there's full uh, buy-in by all the political parties. 
and uh, this particular government now has the the challenge and and responsibility to to uh, to move that forward. Uh, that's going well. We're seeing some changes already uh, on the front line, but uh, we have a plan, you know, literally laid out for the next five years to really transform. And we think, and we want, we know in this case, we do have to move, move more resources in and move them out to the community. And so we're looking uh, at all of that. Uh, we're taking an institutional call to Waterford, and we're going to break that down and remove that, you know, from uh, from the lexicon going forward. So, uh, so that's all in play, uh, sort of as literally as we speak. So I think I'll let Herb respond if he wants to Sheila's yeah. comment, yeah. but then also any other thoughts he has on what the other panelists said. <clears throat> uh, yeah, so full disclosure, I'm also from the West Coast originally. Uh, so I spent time in every region of Canada until moving to Atlantic Canada was my first opportunity to live here. The fracking ban point wasn't so much in the context of we must frack in order to be better. The context is in the era of social license, a lot of our investment historically has come in infrastructure from private sector, so pipelines, development of the resource base. And that's where the jobs come in, is really the development stage, not the production. But what I was trying to highlight is that when we have these moratoriums and we have international capital, it doesn't just signal shale fracking is closed for business. It may signal other mining operations that you don't mind are going to be an issue. So on the West Coast, they're still trying to get their LNG going, but they have the same challenges now around getting social license for that to go forward. And they're losing a lot of investment. If you total up foreign investment in resource projects that's gone away and even Canadian investment over the last four years, you'll see that we're now getting up into the hundreds of billions in foregone investment. All because we won't resolve the social license issue and decide when are you allowed to go forward with the project. So if Canadians really don't want to do this, that's great. It, this is not an economic issue. This is a political issue that you have your values and you'll decide how you want to make your money. On the other side, with oil, I agree, it's not a big employment generator, but all the activity around it is. But the biggest challenge is when you get that oil and you're taking your royalty, even if you're a passive rentier government, what are you doing with that money? Are you doing what Norway did and making something that's going to last for good? Or are you just having a big party and hoping it's going to be a hoot when it's all done and <laughs> the hangover is not too bad? On that one for sure. Right. The yeah. Well, in, in Alberta, we heard an example of uh, our policy appears to be we think cake is bad for young people, so we're going to eat it all. <laughs> <laughs> so we were trying to make them healthier and give them a better future. <laughs> and then, just generally on the healthcare side, I think that one of the challenges is that it's kind of the most frustrating world to be in because everyone can see a better place that the system could be in and to make the dollars go further to meet all of those unmet needs in a better way and actually be patient focused and do something for patients first as opposed to worrying about how the providers feel about it. The challenge we have is that we don't, it's the only sector in our society that doesn't rely on a price mechanism to allocate resources. So innovation becomes a problem because we make our providers more productive, they do a better job, it drives volume, it doesn't reduce cost. But if you think about education and how reliant we are on IT type solutions. If you told me we'd have these iPhone things in 1984, I would have laughed yeah. you out of the building. We can't afford that. It'll be a small fortune what you're describing. How are we gonna wire the whole world up? But as we got more productive, all those input prices came down and the cost of computing power, I think is about one six hundredth of what it was 30 years ago on a quality adjusted basis. Healthcare is the only sector we have not allowed pricing to reflect productivity so that when the providers get better, they make more income because they do more volume, but the provider, the payer gets a benefit because they have lower prices. We have to stop talking about healthcare in terms of changing quantities, and we have to start talking about innovation on pricing. How do we bring in the mechanism so that when we get better at something, it's a win-win for the payer, the patient, and the provider, as opposed to right now, it's just the provider, and you put health ministers in the position of saying, no precision medicine, no new devices. We're going to stick with the 19th century approach and hack things off as they come along because we can afford that. This aren't helping with HTA because they're not taking account of diffusion cycles and innovation that we're going to get better using a technology and figure out how to deploy it. 
and the benefit's going to get larger. But instead, we look at not the iPhone to evaluate it. We look at the cell phone of 1980 and say, nah, it's too clunky. We're not investing. And then we find out 30 years later, the rest of the world had wireless. And we're still running around carrying long cables for our landlines. And that's where Canada's fallen behind because of the Canada Health Act, the lack of pricing in the system, and the inability to give levers to health ministers to, you know, they don't have to fire anybody, reduce pay, but there should be more say in where the resources are allowed to go. It shouldn't have to be you fight it out in the front page of a paper every time you want to make a change, which is unfortunately where we're stuck right now. And I'm ranting too much, so I'm going to cut it off there. Thank you very much. Uh, Tony only gets this chance because he's co-chair. <laughs> we're over time for lunch. Sorry but... to abuse the power. So, but... <laughs> <laughs> Just two quick comments, you know, less than a minute. So I really like the idea you said when we talk about the, you know, the overspending, you know, in Medicare, you know, maybe some, something related to supply regulation, for example, medical doctors over time, doing a lot of overtime, but they don't, they don't want to stop that, right? You know, this is supply of, you know, uh, limited supply so they can get a high pay. This is one issue. The other is that maybe the protection of turf, you talk about, it, you talk about that, you know, some, sometime, you know, we, we interview the, some companies or whatever, and they always say, this is perfect, fine, you know, we no need to do research, you know, or innovation, whatever, we're doing the best job. But, you know, sometimes it's just kind of, I think it's the issue, not really about, you know, lack of, you know, human resources or something, but sometimes just, you know, kind of protection of the turf. I'm not sure. Yeah. Uh, anybody on the panel have a compelling need to speak one more time? There's wise people. I love that. <laughs> compelling need to eat. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So uh, we're going to break for a lunch. We'll thank the panel in a second. Uh, we're going to come back 12.10 sharp. And uh, you can get your lunch outside, bring it back in here. And I think it's been just a, an amazing morning, and I don't say that lightly. So thanks to Herb for getting us on the right foot, the panel, and you. Great start. It'll all come together more this afternoon. Enjoy your lunch. Thanks to the panel.